just to recap the notion of overfitting, a model is overfitted when it is too finely tuned to the details of the training set to the extent that it does not generalise to new data. This may be thought of as fitting the noise rather than the shared structure of the data. Models may be prone to fitting in a variety of different ways, but one reasonably common theme is to offset large contributions from different features with opposing large model weights, and thereby amplifying small differences that are just due to noise in order to get marginal improvements in the loss function. This is particularly a concern if the features are somewhat correlated. To uh, prevent or mitigate overfitting, we apply regularization. And the purpose of that is to encourage fitting of the true regularities in the data as opposed to the random fluctuations. But of course, if we really knew which of those was which, then we wouldn't have the problem in the first place. We don't have a definite way of identifying what is noise that we shouldn't fit and separating it from structure that we really need to fit. And so we have to resort to some kind of heuristics. One of these is Occam's razor, which is informally a preference for parsimonious models. We can choose to interpret that as meaning models with less extreme parameterizations. This is an intuition rather than an ironclad rule, but it is often very helpful. This leads to what are known as shrinkage methods of regularization. There are a range of possibilities. We'll consider a couple here. One is to just reduce the number of features, to use only a subset of the features that are available to you and not fit to them all. Another is to reduce the overall scale of the parameters in the model. That is to say, just to really do less fitting. Another, which is closely related to downscaling, is to encourage sparsity to encourage the fitting process to set the weights for less important parameters to zero. This is effectively another kind of feature selection, but done in a more automated fashion. Perhaps the simplest and most intuitive way of approaching this problem is feature selection. In this case, we explicitly choose to retain or exclude some of the features available to us in order to reduce the scope for overfitting. There's several ways of approaching this. Null in general mean fitting multiple models to different subsets of the features and then applying some criterion to choose the one we like the best. Generally, we will estimate the performance of each model using cross-validation or an explicit validation set and then apply a criterion that trades off the number of parameters estimated in the model against the performance. Examples of this are the AIC, which is the Akaiki Information Criterion, or the BIC, which is the Bayes Information Criterion. Both of these effectively weight the number of parameters against the increase in performance. There are a number of approaches to choosing the candidate models that will be used for feature selection. One of them is best subset approach. This is basically an exhaustive approach that tries all of the different possible combinations for different numbers of features and then trades them off. There are also stepwise selection approaches. These uh, select features one by one. You can do this as forward stepwise selection where you start with a model with no features and add them one at a time. Or you can do backward and stepward selection where you start with a model that has all of the features and then remove them one at a time. At each step you will try all of the features but you won't try all of the combinations. Stepwise selection is an example of a greedy algorithm. As discussed last week, greedy algorithms can be very successful but there is the possibility that you will wind up being 
thwarted by poor choices early in the process and wind up with a very suboptimal set of parameters chosen by the end. A common regularization approach is to apply a penalty in the loss function to deter the fitting process from doing things you don't want it to do. The new loss function will look something like this. It has two components. The first component represented here by the function d is our original distance metric representing the badness of performance of our model. And the new term p is some penalty which penalises the things we don't want the model to do. The coefficient lambda is a hyperparameter which manages the balance between these two different outcomes that we're looking for. If we're thinking about applying a regularization penalty to least squares of regression, then the loss function would look like this. We'll consider two specific cases of this form of regularization. In ridge regression, the penalty applied to the model weights takes the same form as the original penalty on the residuals. That is, it's the squared L2 norm. What this means is make the weights as small as possible. When we construct the updated loss function with this penalty term, it remains convex, it remains differentiable, and indeed it still has a closed form solution. We won't go through the derivation in detail, most of it is exactly the same as for the original unregularized case. But there's an additional term in the loss function throughout this lambda w transpose w. We can apply the quadratic form identity from before to this term and we get that the gradient of this term is 2 lambda times the identity matrix times the weights vector. When we solve this expression for w star, this gives us an additional factor which goes into the inverse term. So the new expression with ridge regularization looks like this. Importantly, adding this extra value of lambda to the diagonals in x transpose x compensates for any lack of invertibility due to correlations between the different features. It effectively decorrelates the rows, equivalently the columns, making x transpose x more invertible. One thing to note is that here, and in all the shrinkage methods, we don't want to regularize the intercept term. So if the approach that we've taken to the intercept is to include it as an extra dummy element, then we need to exclude that from the calculation of the penalty. Shrinkage methods are also sensitive to differences in scale between the feature dimensions, so uh, it's often useful to standardize the data when using this kind of regularization. Another regularization method, which is at least structurally very similar to ridge regression, is LASSO, which stands for Least Absolute Shrinkage and Selection Operator, an acronym that somebody obviously worked very hard on. LASSO takes the same form of applying a penalty to the weights, but instead of using the L2 norm, or the squared L2 norm on the weights, it instead uses the L1 norm, or the sum of the absolute values. This loss is still convex, but unlike for ridge regression, it is no longer strictly differentiable because the L1 norm has a sharp corner in it. The optimization looks nearly identical, but it can no longer be solved in closed form. It's usually posed as a quadratic programming problem, but we won't go into the details on that here. Although the lasso loss function is not differentiable, it's relatively straightforward to define a subgradient for it, which can be used for gradient-based optimization. The really crucial feature of lasso, of L1 
normal regularization in general, is that it is able to set weights exactly to zero, whereas ridge regression generally will not do this. Consequently, it encourages sparsity. It is sometimes considered as a proxy for optimizing another penalty, which is the L0 pseudonorm, which basically says, is there anything there or not, rather than what is the size of each parameter. That pseudonorm is often a useful way of conceptualizing sparsity, but it is completely intractable to optimize for large problems. One way of trying to get a feel for the differences between the effects of ridge regression and lasso is to have a look at the penalty landscapes that they produce. In these plots, we're looking at the different components of the loss function for a random problem in a 2D feature space. In the first plot, we can see the least squares loss, just the residual sum of squares. This has a quadratic bowl-shaped form, and its minimum is the point that would be discovered by unregularized least squares fitting. The second plot shows the values of the penalty for ridge regression. This is, again, a quadratic form. It just has a symmetrical bowl shape, and its minimum is, of course, at zero. In the third case, we can see the penalty for lasso, the L1 norm penalty. In this case, again, the minimum is at zero, but the loss is not quadratic. It has an inverted pyramid shape. So the shape of the landscape in each quadrant is planar, and they all descend down towards the middle of the diagonal. The values along the axes here are lines of local minimum. They form gutters in the loss function. We show the losses combined. In the ridge case, we have a combined quadratic. It's still bowl-shaped. It still has a single minimum somewhere between the original and zero and it's smooth everywhere. In the case of the lasso loss, with a small lambda, it's still pretty similar to the original least squares loss. As the value of lambda increases, the balance shifts more towards the inverted pyramid of the L1 loss. The important thing is that the sharp edges of the L1 loss add a line of local minimum into the smooth space of the loss function. As the loss is optimized, as a weight finds its way towards the gutter, it will never come out of it again. We can see that here in a video form. Here, the value of lambda is being shifted, and as it increases, the value for the weight W2 rapidly finds its way onto the axis, and then it will be zero from then on. Obviously, for both ridge and lasso, you're introducing a new hyperparameter, lambda, and you have to find some way of setting this. You will probably find your validation set useful for this purpose.